Hey, how y'all doing? Good. good, all three of you. That's good. Appreciate that. How y'all doing? Good. Listen, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I do want to tell Mr. Hopkins I appreciate the opportunity. You know, I should get a standing ovation because you guys are out of class, and actually, I prospected you guys to come speak to you. Uh, I actually went to Mr. Hopkins and asked for the opportunity. I typically take the time to speak to high schoolers because I think the story I have and the perception some may have about me, it doesn't matter when I was in Atlanta, Miami, Florida, Augusta, Georgia, or here in Milledgeville, people have a, a certain persona of who they think I am. And uh, I've been very blessed and fortunate, so I'd like to share the story because I think there's a lot of people in the room that may resonate and have similar scenarios. So I do want to thank you again for the opportunity. I do want, want you to know, um, I, I'm a businessman. I run a Toyota dealership. I know how to sell cars. And if I was talking to you on how to make money, if I was talking to you on how to set goals and all that kind of stuff, I could do that easily and show you guys how to do some of those things. But this is an opportunity where I'm actually speaking to try to hopefully let you guys be inspired of what you guys can do with your life. What I ask of you to do as you're listening, do me a favor. Each of you are blessed with a dominant gift. And only you know what that gift is. And as I'm talking, I want you to think about the gift. Like, what are you really, really good at? What are you naturally good at? The thing that you're often good at, you keep inside because you're scared to show it. Because as you get older, the more peer pressure kicks over and it becomes not cool to do the things you love. That's why people tease everybody dancing in front of people. When you're five and six years old, you're rocking. By the time you're a junior or senior, you don't know what to see you dancing. So I want you to think about what your dominant gift is and what you think you do well at because I think some of the things we're going to talk about uh, may help you out. So here's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about leadership growth. And some of you may be thinking to yourself, well, why is that important? Well, really, leadership growth is really personal growth. You become a good leader when you grow personally. And some of you are, are a leader in your own house. You're a big brother, you're a big sister. And as you get older, you're going to need to know this thing called leadership growth. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. We're going to talk about your value because unfortunately I think some of you in the room may think your value is this big. And the reason why you feel that way is because your friends and sometimes your parents in some way tell you you've got no value. You can't do it. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about your life. We're going to do a little storytelling. I'm going to tell you my story and then I'm going to hopefully share with you how you can create a great story for yourself. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about listening skills because it's important to catch what I'm saying. So I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. I need a volunteer. I'm waiting. Anybody? There you go. Thank you. I appreciate it. You can sit down. I need a volunteer. Okay. So let's just examine what just happened. We asked for a volunteer. We've got a public setting. And all of a sudden, the fear creeps in. But see, that's what happens as you get older in life. In your job, in college... People want you to stand up for something, and everybody sits on the sidelines. So notice, in life, when you get out on the sidelines and get in the game, that's how you get paid. That's how things happen. So examine as you sat there, nobody wanted to do it. A few of you did, and I acknowledge that. And you did as well. So we're going to do a little listening test, and we're talking about listening skills. You a good listener? You're not? <laughs> Let's give it a shot, okay? I'm going to tell you a word. I want you to repeat the word when I ask you to repeat it, and spell the word. Very easy word. The word is silk. What's the word? Silk. The word is silk. Spell the word silk. S-I-L-K. Okay, the word is silk. What's the word again? Silk. Spell the word? S-I-L-K. Okay, what's the word? Silk. What do cows drink? Milk. Okay. We got to listen because cows give milk, but they drink water. That's why we got to listen. So it's important. It's important to realize that as I'm talking... Make sure you pay close attention because there'll be some things that could go over your head and you could be drinking milk and you should be drinking water. Thanks for playing. I appreciate it. All right, give them a hand, guys. All right. Let's crank this up. I told you a long time ago, guys, don't ever let anybody tell you you can't. Never. Okay? Never. Never let anybody tell you you can't because you can't. Fight. That's all I've asked you to do. Is fight for me with everything you work. Who came to play football today? Whatever it takes. Offensively, got to change the pace of the game now. Don't let them get comfortable. Touchdown, Randy Moss. Let's go out, start it fast. Leave nothing on the field. Come out, swing it. Cardinals blocked it. It's picked up. It's a touchdown. Cardinals win. If you hit like that. 
you play like that, you can beat anybody in the world on any given day. I want winners. I want people that want to win. We got a bunch of proud, valiant warriors. And the Ravens are in the end zone. We got a bunch of men in here that did something special. Was it perfect? No, was it pretty? No, but it was us. It feels good. It feels Ravens. real good, and we're going to get a lot better. Big Joe's are in the house. Make a call and do it with conviction. Conviction, like you know what you're doing. Gonna throw deep. Near side going for fifth. He's in double coverage. It doesn't matter. Why not us? school, which I'm internally grateful for, and, uh, and so I go to Hollywood Christian School, and I remember first going to that Christian school, and they used to talk about this Jesus thing all the time, and quite honestly, it freaked me out, I and mean, I had not want nothing to do with it, and I'd sit in, we didn't have assemblies, we had chapels, that's what we had, we had someone come in, they'd speak about the Lord or whatever, and I remember that I had this huge pain in my heart, because I'm living in this environment every day, I'd go, home, I'd go to this Christian school, but everything was nice and rosy, and then I'd go home, and it'd be chaos. And, uh, you know, I was a void in my heart. And I remember one, one chapel service, I was feeling funny. I couldn't explain it, but I know that uh, something was going on. So I talked to my teacher, Miss Harris, and I explained to her, I said, something's going on. I don't know what it is, but I know it's, it's feeling funny. Well, she knew exactly what it was. She knew the Lord was working in my heart. So she takes me outside, sixth grade, and, uh, and I accepted Christ. And from that day forward, my life radically changed. See, because growing up, I didn't feel like I had a worldly father. My dad was there, but he wasn't there. But I knew I had a heavenly father, and that's what carried me through. As I got older, I had many people in my life, similar to probably some of you guys, good coaches, good teachers, and we're going to talk about bakers and butlers in a minute, and I had a bunch of them. But my passion to get out of this house was football. So I thought to myself, I was going to play football in the NFL. Before I got there, I was going to go play for the University of Florida. No booze? I said the University of Florida, the Gators? Got a couple Gator fans? That's where Norm and I get moved off the stage right there. Okay, all the Bulldog fans. Where's JT? Because she's not around here. Um, but anyways, I thought I was going to go to University of Florida. And all growing up, my dad would always tell me in his, in his certain way, you're not good enough, you're not fast enough, you're not black enough, you're not good, don't jump high enough. You, I mean, that's, that's what he was. That's what he talked about. That's how he was. Okay? So what he created was this desire in my stomach. It was like a furnace. And so it was a desire to prove him wrong. And um, so anyways, I remember February 6th, it was signing day. And I was all excited because I had Coach Charlie Strong come down from Florida. And I, I really thought I was going to Florida, but you had to get a 700 on your SAT. And I wasn't that smart. I think you got like 500 just for putting your name on. Well, anyways, I'm sitting in my Camaro. Mom gives me the mail. And I'm looking at it. I'm so excited because all I need to know is I got over 700. I'm getting ready to sign five days later. So I think... And I get a 680. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, man, God, why is this happening to me? I mean, I was over and over. I said, why am I in this house? Why is this happening to me? This is the way I can get out of this. Lord, you know this is the way I'm getting out. You know? And I didn't realize at the time that it wasn't happening to me. It was actually happening for me. See, because God derailed me, and I ended up going to Liberty University, which is a Christian college. Now, at the time, my ego was pretty big, and I didn't... You know, again, my dad, I felt my mind was right because I didn't get a full scholarship and I didn't go to the University of Florida. So in my mind, it resonated. He was right again. So that fire kept burning in my stomach, trying to prove him wrong. So after I go to Lynchburg, Virginia, I realized after I'm there for a year that I'm not even going to play Liberty because I had a guy that 
went on to play 12 seasons in the NFL for the Denver Broncos that was in front of me. And so I didn't transfer or sit because he was one year ahead. So I called my coach in South Florida and I said, listen, I don't care where I need to go play football, but I need to get out of here because I'm not going to play. He said, well, give me some, some scrimmage film and what you have and I'll see what I can do. Now he used to coach in Georgia in high school. So he calls me back up and he says, I got you a school in Georgia. I said, okay, what school is that? He says, it's, it's in Carrollton. It's called West Georgia. I said, what is West Georgia? He said, that's Division II school. So here goes my ego again. More failure. More failure. More you can. More here comes your dad's right. At the time, I just said, well, listen, can you give me any kind of money? So he gave me some money. My dad had contributed the first year of Liberty because I had books and tuition and partial scholarship, which I hated because he hated to do it. But at that point, I had an opportunity to go get some more scholarship money and be completely on my own. Wanted to be on my own. I remember I was I had a conversation with my mom, and I said to her, you know, we talk very, very seldom. And I said, every time I try to call you guys, there always seems to be some kind of problem. So why don't we, why don't we just not talk? Because it sounds like that's what everybody in the house wants to do. They don't want anything to do with me. So why don't we just not talk? Well, she didn't like the idea, but she understood the idea. So that was what we did. So from 18 years old, I didn't talk to my parents until I was probably 26 years old. If it wasn't for my wife, who kind of rekindled that. I don't know what I would have done. I, I didn't really have any grudges. I was just ready to move all my life. I just wanted to get, get moved. And I remember when I had that conversation with my mom, I'm driving up the Blue Ridge Mountains in, in Liberty. And y'all, I'll be honest with you, man. I was sitting there crying like a baby. I'm 18 years old. I'm thinking to myself, oh, my goodness, this is it, man. I'm on, I'm on my own. I'm by myself. I got to figure out how to make money. I got to figure out what I'm going to do. But I knew I wasn't going home. I knew I wasn't going to come back home to South Florida to work with my dad at the roofing company. I knew that wasn't happening. So I go to... West Georgia College, and um, sign up there, play football there for three or four years. Well, meanwhile, I'm going to be a coach and a teacher because the NFL dream went away because I wasn't good enough to play in the NFL. So there goes another failure. I thought for certain I was going to make it in the NFL, but that didn't happen. So um, I'm waiting tables at Chili's, and I'm working at Lowe's Distribution Plant in Villa Rica on a graveyard shift. I was working from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I was working 36 hours, going to school, and waiting tables at Chili's. And I had this guy that was a Metro Dade cop in Miami would come to Chili's all the time. He said, hey, man, you need to get in the car business. And I was like, man, I ain't never get in the car business, man. You know, because my perception of car people. I said, I'm never going to be in the car business. Well, he got me to go in one summer. And so I, I go in the car business, and next thing you know, I like it. So I took off in the car business, very similar that I did with, uh, with athletics. I just figured out who was that guy, what is he doing, how does he have that position, and I just went and attacked him. I mean, I just did what I could to, to get to the next level, get to the next level. So I've been blessed along the way to find out, you know, to get to where I'm at. You know, obviously, you know, in the car business, at, at 28, I was able to be a general manager, you know, really just a young kid at 28 years old, and then I was able to be a partner in Augusta in the car dealership, uh, mortgage my house, mortgage everything I had, got in big fights with my wife, you know, putting all the money we had into this, you know, deal to, to do something. And, and it worked out, and then again, God's favor just, just kept on and kept on. So, you know, there, there, when you look at everything, I want to go back to Bakers and Butlers. I want you to clue into something. If I hadn't had Bakers and Butlers in my life, I could have been in severe trouble. So what is a baker? What does a baker do? He bakes cakes, right? He bakes, has recipe, right? There are people that you have in your life right now that have the recipe for you to succeed right now. You bump into them all the time. As young people, though, the problem is that sometimes it's hard to see the picture when you're stuck in the frame. You don't know what you don't know. I was like you. I didn't know what I didn't know because all you have is your, your experience, your life experience, and it's only 16, 17, 15, 18 years worth. So these people that are bakers that are in your life, coaches, teachers, uh, friends of uh, your friends' parents, uh, folks at church, people that you know in the community, these people are reaching out to you. Somebody right now, somebody sitting out here Somebody's going through something and somebody's reaching out to you and you're not listening. You're avoiding it. For whatever reason. I don't know what it is. But open up to them. you got to understand that there are, there are bakers in your life. There's also butlers. You guys know what a butler does? He serves. He serves. Right? He serves or he opens doors, right? you got to look for the butlers because those are the doors that are going to be open. you got to find the opportunities. And the butlers are all around. He's going to open doors for you as you get older. Okay? 